where we can try and help um, brands to understand what consumers are doing online in China. Although Google said that they pulled out the Chinese market because they didn't want to cooperate the Chinese government, I think, I think deep down it's because they simply don't understand the Chinese market. Why are Chinese websites so complex? Why are they so cluttered? Um, but yeah, I mean that's that's literally because we're seeing it from a Western eye. Facebook and Twitter really should be looking at China and seeing what they're doing and how are they getting this ridiculous amount of engagement. So Cumin essentially is a UK-China digital marketing agency. Um, we focus a lot on analytics, creative content, attributing offline to online marketing. I think the most in interesting, the most unique part about us is that we try and take what we've learned in the West. Um, so through years of trial and error, testing, research, um, all the best practice knowledge that, that I've learned from my previous experience and applying it to China, but also adding a local element, a native understanding of the Chinese marketplace. I came to the UK when I was 11 years old and my best memory of China was when I used to go to these uh, night markets with my cousins. Um, you have a lot of these in China on the streets, lots of small stores and you have all these great food cooking on the streets, it's really fragrant. Um, and, and my favourite food on the night market was um, these lamb skewers. Uh, they're really, really, really thin skewers of lamb and they sort of like cook them about a hundred at a time and they cook them on really, really hot uh, bed of coal, like a barbecue type of thing. Um, they cook them really fast and the main ingredient were chili and cumin um, and cumin, the sort of like the smell and the taste of cumin just became one of the best part of my childhood memory and when I decided to start cumin I thought um, because it's still with China why not name it after something I love anyway. The Chinese market is really really different to all of, a lot of the Western markets so brands generally enter, um, when they're UK or US brand they, they try to enter the, the European market first um, and generally for those markets they won't need to um, you know, create a whole new website, the language is, is not completely different and the culture is, is very similar. Um, but in China, everything, so e even the way they browse the internet is completely different. Uh, the language is, instead of using um, the alphabet, it's obviously character based. Um, and, and the culture, the way people communicate with each other is fundamentally different. So in order to enter the Chinese market, a lot of the brands need to understand the Chinese market. So they come to us and they ask us to um, help them I think most people probably know that Google, sort of, um, Google, eBay, to a certain extent, tried to enter into the Chinese market. Um, and um, although Google said that they pulled out the Chinese market because they didn't want to cooperate the Chinese government, I think, I think deep down, it's because they simply don't understand the Chinese market. When when I speak to Chinese people about Google, they sort of they they wonder why Google exists because China already has Baidu and everyone uses Baidu. Um, so. Um, and it seems that they don't, it seems that they, they feel like when they enter the Chinese market, they're already Google, they're massive, they're huge in the US, they're huge in the UK, they're huge in the rest of the world. Why should we try and adapt us for the Chinese market? They should already be using us. Um, and that's not the case. Um, Chinese people are already used to their own platforms. Unless you try to really adapt to the local market, it's, it's not going to work. And same with eBay as well, I think. Uh, when eBay tried into the market, there already was a similar platform called Tobo. And when eBay first entered it, again, they had the same mentality that, you know, we're, we're a huge global company, uh, we have to hold on to our brand, we shouldn't try and modify what we're doing for the Chinese market. And I think that's one of the main reasons why, they, um, why some big brands fell in the Chinese marketplace. The Chinese landscape changes so much, it changes so fast, it's really hard for us to um, do the best practice that works now because it might not work literally tomorrow. Uh, so what we're all trying to do is um, 
uh, again, looking at what the West has done, um, my philosophy is that the Chinese digital marketing landscape is, is about a few years behind the West. So anything we do in terms of search or social media or even, or even advertising to a certain extent is, um, is always following the Western best, best practice and Western standards. So when we bring it to China, it's, it's future-proof already. China is ahead in certain areas of digital, but behind in other areas of digital. So it's, it's really weird because China, is, China tends to be very far ahead in terms of uh, innovation on the usage and the platform side, um, but it's very behind in terms of analyzing whole users' user platform. So I think we really get the opportunity to really understand what the Chinese consumers are doing online and what the platforms are doing to encourage them to go online and, and consume information or even generate information, content. Um, but for us, we need to really be more understanding of how these users and platforms are, um, are engaging with each other and leveraging that information with digital marketing. And that's an area where China is behind understanding the, the usage online and applying that to digital marketing campaigns. Think global and act local for us is, um, is, is all about taking, again, what we've learned in the West in terms of digital marketing. So all the research, all the, all the many years of research and, and, and um, analysis that we've, we've come up with and taking it to applying it to the local market in China or the digital landscape in China. Um, and th that's, that's an advantage for us because the Chinese digital industry is so young that a lot of the a lot of the marketers come from a traditional backgrounds, so they're not used to um, digital analysis. Um, so what we're doing is what we're doing is still way ahead of the, the local practices. So the one-size-fits-all approach doesn't really suit the Chinese market, mainly because of the different tiers of cities in China. Um, so um, we have tier one cities that are really westernized, and tier two cities, and tier three cities that sometimes even lack the infrastructure for internet. So a lot of the a lot of the people access internet via their mobile devices. So for example, we might have like a strategy for desktop and a different strategy for mobile devices, um, depending on which, which type of city and what the audience is for the brands we're working for. So a lot of the work we do has to be catered for tier one specifically, or tier two or tier, or tier two slash tier three specifically. One good example is one of my friends, he works in Digital Insights, so he does research for brands. Um, he, he found out that Burberry, um, chi Chinese people actually search for Burberry using different names in different parts of the country. So for example, tier one will search for Burberry using the English name, um, just B-U-R-B-E-R-Y. But in tier three and tier two cities, they generally search for using the Chinese name. But interesting is that there's actually two Chinese names for Burberry. So in, in tier two cities, they sort of use one, chi one type of Chinese name, the official Chinese name for Burberry. But tier three, tier four, where there's a lot of new money um, from natural resources, they sort of made up their own name for Burberry. So that's a really example of how even one single brand can be segmented so much in China. There are specific differences in digital marketing when comparing the China West for each and every channel. Um, the most important one and the most obvious one, I think, is probably the, the, the browsing experience and usability and the way people browse websites. Um, so, for example, when we look at websites in the West, we tend to only really look at the, the top section and the right and the left section. So it's more like, it's like an inverse L shape, the heat map, the way people read and click on websites. But in China, people tend to go a lot further down the page, so they like to consume a lot of information on the home page before they decide where they want to go. Whereas the West, we have overly simplified customer journey. We tell the audience where they need to go, you know, really, really obvious call to actions and, and really minimalist home page design. Uh, so that's one of the key differences. People want to consume more information, decide for themselves. It always looks really busy, Chinese websites, because the characters are so close together and doesn't seem to be any sort of spacing to differentiate the different paragraphs or characters at all. But um, the thing is, Chinese people are used to reading that, and they can scan through all of that complex looking characters really, really fast. So for them, it's not, it doesn't look clutter. It, it's, just, it's just reading normally. Um, that's one of the main things that most of our clients think when we're designing websites. You know, why, why are Chinese websites so complex? Why are they so cluttered? Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's literally because we're seeing it from a Western eye. 
social media, again, it's, it's growing, it's really popular in China, it's growing at an extremely rapid rate, I think mainly because um, people are already used to communicating online regularly before social media came along. So forums, um, forums, and forums were massive in China before social media arrived. Um, everyone, they had millions of specific niche forums for all the different topics. Um, and when social media came along, it seemed like a natural evolution for people to take their peer-to-peer -peer communication online and create user-generated content to the next step, um, and, and that's social media. It, it, it seems natural for Chinese people because the culture is really expressive and quite talkative anyway. Um, so taking it online is, is, like I said, a nat natural step, I think. So the major, plas major social media platforms in China are Sina Weibo. Um, it's a combination of Facebook and Twitter. So, for example, you can start a conversation thread in Sina Weibo, but you're limited to 140 characters, just like Twitter. Uh, you can also add media attachments, which is not available in Twitter. So Sina Weibo is a good example of, of Twitter and Facebook combined. And the next one, the next big one, most recently, is probably WeChat. So it's a bit, it's like an instant messaging app, but it also has social media elements. So you can post your photos, your feeds, um, what you're doing on a day-to-day basis. Again, a bit, a bit like Facebook, but it's completely mobile-based. You can't access it on, on the desktop computer. And most people use it for instant messaging. Zhenren is a really good platform. Um, that's very similar to Facebook. It's focused at university and college students. Uh, it's not as big as some of the other social media platforms, but it is very similar to Facebook. There is a platform called Douban. It's a lot focused on culture and music and films. Um, a, lot of people, a lot of people say that's very similar to MySpace. It's, it's actually a very niche platform, and it's, it's, it's up and coming, it's growing. Again, it doesn't have as many followers as places like Cineweb and WeChat, but it's very similar to um, MySpace. Yuku is almost exactly the same as YouTube, only with more adverts. <laughs>
and then it, it sort of it got to a point where it became a little bit a little bit tacky, and people were calling Louis Vuitton bags the six-second bags because every six seconds you would see a Louis Vuitton bag. Um, so the strategy that Vuitton used to change that image of themselves is to come up with a new line in China completely. More recently, that is um, really plain. So it, it's just plain colors with really uh, subtle logos. Um, and I think as consumers become more and more advanced in China, they actually start to look for less obvious products. Um, they're looking for more niche stuff, more sophisticated, focusing maybe more on heritage and quality of the product. This has happened mostly in tier one because, um, because I think tier two and tier three, three cities still have a lot of nouveau rich. So, um, so, so consumers are still quite quite new to a lot of these luxury products. Uh, but in tier one, they've had, the, they've had this for, ten, for a decade, if not two decades now. Uh, they're, becoming, um, they're becoming more and more aware of, of, of brands that are maybe not as obvious as, as Vuitton or Gucci. Elite platforms in China are um, specific social platforms that are really exclusive, so a lot of them are invite only. Um, one, one of the most famous ones is probably P1.CN. Um, you have to be invited um, by a uh, by, by quite a few of, quite a few of its, its team members in order for you to join and, and there's different caps, different membership levels for your earning levels. So it's, it's all very focused on high end. A lot of people talk about um, what they buy and what they've bought, taking pictures of what they're wearing today. Um, but unfortunately, um, P1 specifically has had a bit of a downturn recently because it's, it's, it's becoming a bit more... Um, it's not as sophisticated as they originally wanted to be. It's becoming more and more tacky. People are posting pictures of themselves. Um, but there are other platforms like specific luxury watch ones or luxury jewelry ones that, that people tend to um, socialize in. But they, they are sort of invite only as well. Space, the ultimate ambition. Traditionally dominated by Russia and America, space is a high-stakes aspiration where the risks are high. But so are the rewards. No longer the final frontier, we chart the story of China's race to space and bring the highlights from the Shenzhou missions to UK screens. From launch to landing, we'll tell the stories of the architects, the astronauts, the feats of engineering, and their experiments. Destination Mars. A season for Propeller TV charting China in space coming soon to Sky 189 and online. The current trend in the UK is all about being the quintessential gent and I'm going to be showing you the best places in London to get the look. Yeah, I like it so much. It's great. Street，在那里，音乐和时尚的猛烈撞击，至今仍吸引着无数艺术家和潮人们。英伦经典，新锐品牌。
China has a firewall around the whole of the country, so any traffic that goes in or out of China has to go through the firewall. And this slows down the traffic for people visiting websites outside of China or people in China visiting foreign websites. Um, so what we try to do with all of our brands is we try to host them inside China. So if, if they're only facing the Chinese audience, there's no reason for anyone else to read their content. So we want to make sure the Chinese audience can read the content as fast and as, as easy as possible. Um, so Chinese hosting is really important to make sure you're within the Chinese firewall. And keywords in China is even more important in the West because the Chinese language is so complex. So one single word can mean you know, 10, 20, 30 different things in different contexts. So we need to make sure the, whatever keywords we're targeting for our clients are related to their specific industry and their niche uh, rather, than, rather than taken out of context and, and showing up for un unrelated searches. We do a lot of marketing for international brands, so we open Weibo accounts for them um, inside China. And sometimes we do posts outside of China. So um, one thing that we've found out is that if you do posts on Weibo outside of China, it's very erratic whether it will become public or not. So Weibo, um, Weibo actually blocks posts sometimes um, if they think the post is coming from multiple IPs. So what we try to do is always make posts inside of China so it doesn't look suspicious to Weibo or on Chinese government. The reason I think they do that is because of the Chinese government. So they're, they're really careful with the kind of content and uh, they're putting out and who's putting out those content. So it's always best to try and post inside of China. Search engine optimization is about um, making sure your products or your services rank in, in search engine results when people are, are looking to buy your product or service. So uh, an example might be uh, uh, plumbers in London, uh, and you'd want yourself to rank, if, if, you, if you're a plumber, you'd want yourself to rank on the page one when people are searching for you. And search engine optimization is about making sure your content on the web is coolable, indexable by the website, and it's also, um, and it's, it's also a lot more creative now. So it's, 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 it's about generating creative content so people want to talk about your website, people want to link you. So again, I go back to us about learning from traditional advertising. A lot of search engine optimization these days is probably more about PR than anything else, and, and a bit of technical, of course. <laughs> Brands need to protect their names in China. Um, there's always going to be loads of fakes out there, so people trying to imitate you, try to be you know, KDC instead of KFC or whatever. <laughs> you see stuff like that all the time on the streets. But, um, one of the best ways to protect your brand is to, to register your brand names on social media as, as early as possible, even if you don't plan to launch into the Chinese market in the next few years, even if you don't have a website, even if you don't plan to maintain the social media accounts. Um, the best way, it's, it's similar in the West as well, the best way to register your brand name, register social profiles, but an extra step is to get yourself verified. You can't really, it's really hard to do this on Twitter and Facebook, but in China it's relatively simple to get yourself verified so you get a little logo, a V Verify logo, to show that you're the official brand. Um, so yeah, the, the best way, again, is to register yourself and make sure you're there, even if you don't plan to enter the market in the near future. Monetization and is, is actually a really, really interesting area in China. Um, monetization of social media specifically, um, they've, they face the same problems as they do in the West. So places like Facebook and Twitter never really fully successfully monetize their platforms. Um, and China, Chinese social platforms I've seen in Weibo face, and WeChat face the exact same problems. Um, but instead of sort of like keeping on, keeping with the traditional way of doing more and more adverts, um, they're trying to come up new ways of monetizing the products. So, for example, um, it's, really, it's really funny because in the West you see brands and celebrities paying agencies to get them more followers. So they're spending money to get their social media following, followership up. Whereas in China, this celebrity thought to himself, well, you know, if you want to see what I'm doing on daily lives, you want to see more pictures of me and more, you know, videos of me, that, that's a privilege. I shouldn't, I shouldn't have to pay an agency so you can see what I'm doing. So he decided to charge his fans to follow him. Um, so the package is ranging from 18 yuan, one pound 80, up to about 16, 16 pounds. 
and then with that you can get exclusive um, status of what he's doing, you can get exclusive pictures, videos, uh, and he'll even say goodnight to you before you sleep. So uh, it's a really interesting way of monetizing the, the platform. That's from the user side. And from the platform side, um, they're always trying to encourage engagement. So they've come up with this new way of 100% reach. It's a, it's, a, it's a way of advertising so that when you're promoting your post, every single one of your followers will see your ad um, when they log in, but only once. And then it gets pushed down naturally with the rest of the, product, rest of the feeds. So it's really great for competitions or events when you want to make sure all of your followers know exactly what's happening. Um, again, that's a really good, I think it's a really, really um, innovative way of, of, of advertising on social media platforms. There's a lot of really, really cool stuff that are coming. Um, so for example, I heard the, the, I heard the other day about um, someone talking about um, volumetrics, so measuring people's heart rates, measuring people's pulses. Uh, and, and leveraging that data to give people specifically targeted advertising. And I, I think, I mean, for me, that's really cool, but I think it gets to a stage where people's privacy needs to be, um, needs to be thought about before we, before we think about these really awesome new innovative ways of um, serving people av advertising and marketing material. Um, other core cool stuff is obviously augmented reality. So, um, Oh, AR changing rooms is a big one, so people can sort of like uh, try on new dresses, new rings, new sunglasses. Um, offline, online attribution is massive, so um, th that's, that's, that's really something that's really hard to get right because you can easily track online with loads of different uh, tracking pixels, tracking code, but when someone walks into a store and buys something, it's hard to attribute where they've heard of that brand and what made them buy that specific product. Whereas online, you can literally track the first click, the first time they view the product, chances are it's going to be social media. Um, the, you know, maybe the last touch they had before they actually made a specific purchase, um, again, chances are it's probably from search engine or direct, um, direct visits to the website or referrals. Um, the next big thing in digital landscape in China, I think, is going to be social e-commerce. Um, in, in the West, we sort of skipped, skipped that phase. Um, it seems like it didn't really work well on Facebook. Um, I think they're still trying to do it, but there's a lot of things that are fundamentally different with the way people interact online. Um, but in China, people, China is actually the highest engagement, highest for social engagement and e-commerce engagement. So it's, and it's literally one of the only countries in the world where that's the case, because most other countries either have a really high social engagement or a really high e-commerce engagement, but China has both. So we always think China's copying the West, but I think it's, it's gotten to a point where the social media platforms are evolving so fast in China and they're doing so well in engaging the audience that some of the bigger platforms like Facebook and Twitter really should be looking at China and seeing what they're doing and how are they getting this ridiculous amount of engagement whereas, and, and even social e-commerce where Western has failed previously.